hello everyone. It's time once again for the VLGA Connect Governance Update. We are, can you believe it, Stephen Cooper? We're into December 2021 and we're into summer. How are you? I'm good, but I'm sort of struggling to work out, Chris, whether we're in summer or not, because just when the seasons sort of start to tell you that you are, um, we turn the heater on again. Oh, how crazy. Three three days in a row of getting above 30 degrees, and then all of a sudden I got up this morning uh, before I took the dogs for a walk, and we were back into single digits. It was like seven degrees or something. <laughs> no. Crazy. Um, we're not starting the summer series yet, folks. We'll probably start that next week because we want to do a special recognition this week of the 16 Days of Activism campaign, hence our special backgrounds. For those of you watching on YouTube, for those of you listening on the podcast, we'll describe it for you. Uh, we've got an orange background. We've got the, uh, the UN uh, global logo, Orange the World, in the top corner with the hashtag 16 Days of Activism. And of course, we've got a recognition for our wonderful sponsors, Hunt and Hunt Lawyers. Well summarised, Chris. Very good. So 16 and Days of Activism, of course, is the global campaign to end gender-based violence. And Steve, I've seen pleasingly so many councils, not just in Victoria, but all around Australia and beyond, doing uh, lots of things like walks uh, to raise awareness of the issue, morning teas, uh, fundraising campaigns, etc., cetera, to, uh, to put towards these activities. And I know you and the team at the VLGA have done something similar. That's true, Chris. Yeah, last week we all um, uh, put our orange bandanas on our pets and uh, went walking separately and uh, did a bit of a post on our social media. And I think it's really important to note, Chris, that these rituals are important, um, that they send a signal of commitment. Um, certainly they don't go all the way. And I think the events, um, particularly nationally this week, uh, would indicate that the, this is a topic that deserves more than just window dressing. Absolutely right. And we'll come back to the Jenkins report on that uh, topic uh, very shortly. So there you go. Um, well done to everyone for getting into that uh, campaign as uh, as you've done this week. And it, it runs through until I think from memory the 10th of December, Steve, that uh, 16 days. So it's not too late to do something. I've got to confess, we went with the orange background because I've got nothing in my wardrobe of that is orange and could be other than a very garish wind cheater, which i don't think uh, viewers would thank me for wearing. Chris, I'm rather pleased we've got the orange background just quietly. <laughs> <laughs> so um, quite a bit of news around. Let's deal with these one by one. Uh, the Minister for Local Government in Victoria has announced that there will be a municipal monitor appointed at the city of Yarra. This announcement came on Monday, I think, the same day that the Supreme Court handed down its judgment about the matter that the uh, Chief Municipal Inspector has brought against a Yarra Council. We'll come back to that in a second. But Steve, were you surprised to hear the announcement that a monitor was going to be put in place at Yarra? We had a conversation about that earlier in the week, Chris, and um, I, I would just make the point first, I think it's, it's an accidental confluence, um, the monitor appointment with the Supreme Court matter. Yes, um, I think for me, I wasn't surprised about the appointment of the monitor. I was surprised that it happened so soon. But on reflection, the minister has been really clear that he sees the appointment of a monitor as a an effective early intervention. Yeah, we've mused on this in the past, haven't we, that we thought that might be the thinking. It's crossed my mind. I wonder if they've got a checklist of some sort. You know, in this case, the uh, the ministers referred to, as we've talked about, those four attempts to hold a meeting to elect a mayor, three failures to achieve an absolute majority. There's a whole range of issues going on behind the scenes, uh, but ultimately uh, the vote's fell the way of uh, Sophie Wade, who's the new uh, mayor of Yarra. But the minister specifically referred to that process in his media release, as well as what were called broader concerns raised by council officers, and the fact that it's been receiving widespread attention. Do you think it's any one or, or all of those things in, in combination that have led it to this point? Oh, I suspect it's the combination, as you've described, Chris. I wonder too whether... Um, at a time, say, if there were a um, chief executive officer performing well midway through their term, um, a minister might be less likely. But if the councils had this level of difficulty electing a mayor, um, it would have to call into question its capacity to make a sound decision for the benefit of the ratepayers 
in regard to the appointment of a CEO. So I suspect that had an impact as well. Yeah, that's a really good point. I hadn't actually considered that. As we said last week, Chris Lever is one of the directors there is, is being installed as an acting CEO. It's not the best time of year as it is to be going through that sort of recruitment process. So I'm assuming, you know, they'll get into that good and proper in the first part of 2022. But yeah, you're right. That's probably something that sits on that that list with a very significant decision that council has to make. Well, it's one of the biggest decisions any council makes. But um, I mean, back to Chris Levers, as we said last week too, Chris, that um, the council is in a safe pair of hands, with a safe pair of hands through that uh, that interim period. Steve, do you think these dramas, and we'll talk about the other, um, the Supreme Court matter now, do you think they send a message that, you know, there's highly qualified, experienced CEOs out there that might be thinking, Perhaps I won't throw my hat in the ring given all of these issues. Do you think it would put people off? Oh, look, you've got to be an employer of choice these days, Chris, that the market is competitive. And, you know, we've been talking recently globally about the great resignation and, you know, people are making different decisions now to what they would have two years ago in terms of what they do with their careers, where they spend their time. And... You know, you and I have spoken recently about the fact that local government is competing with other levels of government. We'll come back to that later. But um, I would have thought definitely um, executives would make a decision as to whether they want to work in a particular organisation given the culture. And it can't help um, if you've got that sort of dysfunction. Given you've gone there, let's deal with this one now. And it's 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 not a it's not a similar set of circumstances. Jesse Holmes this week, the CEO at Yarriambiac Shire Council, has announced her resignation. She's moving on to a role with the Victorian Skills Authority, which is a government agency based uh, in the Wimmera. She will be, which is that that part of the world, of course. Great loss, I think, to oh. local government. And another example of CEO level people making the decision that local government is not for them, at least now, uh, for now and, and, and possibly for the future. And it's, I've got to say, it's really starting to concern me about where we're going as a sector when all of these CEOs are choosing to go as well, elsewhere. Oh, couldn't agree more, Chris. And you and I have both been lucky enough to do some work with Jessie and she is a top shelf offer, operator. So good luck to Skills Victoria for um, recruiting her. But I... I would agree if um, if someone like Jesse, who's relatively young and potentially could have offered, um, you know, many years of quality service to local government is lost to the sector, then we're the poorer for it. I fully expected someone like her to turn up in a in a metro council eventually at the CR level, and who who knows that might still happen. This might be a great career move. For <laughs> we, we won't we won't put the curse of the <laughs> of the governance update on Jesse. <laughs> no, no, let's not. Um, but on that, uh, I've actually been invited to speak about this topic uh, on ABC Mildura uh, next week uh, because they've cottoned on to the fact that they've got in their region four four councils that currently have vacancies at the CEO level, being Mildura, Swan Hill, Yarri Ambiak now, and uh, I assume they're in, including Bullock. Um, another example of a CEO that's left to go to a state government role. And the other two stories are completely different, again, which is something we'll, we'll flesh out. But it is starting to be noticed that this is happening. Oh, no, absolutely, Chris. I, yeah, I think we'll just file that under, under watch this space. Okay, let's go back and tie off the Yarra stuff uh, with a bow. The, we've been watching this with interest. Uh, so just to summarise, and please pick me up if I get any of this wrong, Steve, going back to August, the Chief Municipal Inspector uh, brought a case to VCAT to have uh, Councillor Anab Muhammad at Yarra stood down while charges relating to those assault charges uh, were being heard with. They've not yet been dealt with in, in court. Um, the CMI was running the argument that the councillor should not be uh, operating in the role of councillor while that was happening for a range of reasons. The jurisdiction of VCAT to determine that was challenged because of the, can we call it vague wording? Um, oh, Chris, it was quite apparent that there was a drafting error in the Local Government Act that if you read that section of the Act literally, um, there was no doubt that a literal interpretation would say that the inspector had no such power. Um, but if one looked at the intent of the wording, like the clear and obvious intent of the wording was that the inspector would have that power. So 
uh, Councillor Muhammad uh, took the matter to the Supreme Court, but with the support of the and at the cost of the inspector, because mm. the inspector needed the you know the Supreme Court ruling. So flash forward to 29 November 2021, so just a few months later, and the Supreme Court has delivered its decision this week, and they've really determined two things. One, yes, there was a drafting error in the legislation, and, and it was unintentional, obviously. So this is all about what was the intent or what is the intent of the legislation, and the court has determined that VCAT does indeed have jurisdiction to uh, make a determination on this matter. So... The matter will go back to VCAT. I don't know when yet, do you? No, I don't. I don't, Chris. So, um, yes, again, file under watch this space. Indeed. So, uh, official wording, the matter will now return to VCAT to determine the merits of the application to stand down the defendant under Section 229 of the LGA. So, as you say, watch this space. We'll come back to it. Yeah, and that's where, Chris, sort of, um, you know, the court is asked to choose between what is the intent versus what is the black letter law. Um, and the other interesting um, part with all of this too, I suppose, is the tension between um, the right to a presumption of innocence and clearly the, the government of the day having an intent in making the Local Government Act that where there is a cloud hanging over a councillor due to uh, serious charges that uh, the, the inspector have that stand down power. Um, not quite the same as in Queensland, Chris. No, not the same. Very good point. So um, there is some fresh news on the Queensland uh, Crime and Corruption um, uh, Commission matter. We've talked about this a couple of times and I've been following this a bit on the Local Government News Roundup podcast as well. So this is the story about uh, the eight councillors at Logan City Council that were charged with fraud by the Triple C and stood down. This is, I think, the difference you're getting to, Steve, mm. system. Um, and that was all around the, the matter of the dismissal of the CEO of Logan at the time, Sharon Kelsey, who ultimately lost her unfair dismissal case earlier this year. Um, more recently, uh, those charges were dropped and there's been lots of questions asked about the powers and the exercise of the powers of the Triple C. So this week, Steve, a Queensland parliamentary committee has released a report which has been described as damning. Often it's either a report or a damning report, isn't it? This one is of the, uh, the latter variety, uh, which is saying that the Triple C breached its duty to remain independent and impartial and found that the discretion that it used to charge those eight councillors uh, was miscarried because all material considerations and evidence were not taken into account and weighed. So it's calling for a commission of inquiry into the structure of that anti-corruption body. So uh, lots, lots going to happen there that we'll need to unpack in future and we'll watch that really. With yeah, and interesting, I, I, I'll just make the point really clearly, Chris, that the, the distinction being because um, in Queensland, the, the Triple C had laid the charges. That meant under Queensland legislation that the councillors were stood down automatically. Um, you know, comparing yes. trust where VCAT needed to make an order in Victoria, which sort of goes to the fact that these integrity agencies and the you know the prevailing laws do do vary from state to state or jurisdiction. Wouldn't it be wonderful if that that old um, uh, concept of harmonisation actually occurred uh, at all levels across uh, across the country? It, it does make it very difficult to follow, doesn't it? Um, yeah, it'd be nice though if, I suppose, in that sense, it would be good to have a national um, integrity agency structure that could form a basis as a model for the state structures, Chris, at the risk of being just a tad political. Well, let's talk about that because I know it was the subject of the National Press Club this week, which you, I, I gather, often watch with great, great interest. Well, it's only been the last couple of weeks, Chris, but I, I think I need to be on a commission. But this week, um, the panel was uh, Geoffrey Watson SC, who is a former council assisting the uh, New South Wales ICAC on a number of occasions, Serena Lillywhite from Transparency International Australia, and Pauline Wright from Civil Liberties New South Wales. And I haven't got to listen to Pauline's bit, I only heard the first two. Mm -hmm. But for anyone interested in these topics, it was um, a cracking episode, and you can get it on the ABC iView still. Um, but what I would commend to anyone is David Crow's piece in the Nine Media, uh, otherwise known as The Age Today, where he provides a pretty good analysis of some of the issues that we've just touched on now in terms of those thresholds where um, 
where integrity agencies ought to act. Okay, um, I'll put that on my to-do list, uh, Steve, for the weekend, perhaps, a bit of uh, reading and watching. Um, I'll be checking we... on Monday that you've done it, Chris. Okay, you do that. Um, we want to talk about the Jenkins report. Uh, I, I know you've read a fair bit of it. I haven't had the opportunity yet, but I've certainly seen a lot of the media coverage. What's, what's top of mind for you out of this uh, announcement this week? I thought a couple of interesting things that it's already had an impact and at the risk of straying into political, I thought with the um, interesting that with the allegations of um, misconduct in relation to former Minister Tudge that the Prime Minister has um, set in place some arrangements where the investigation will be undertaken by Vivian Tom, who also undertook the um, investigation into Dyson Hayden QC. And the really important element of that is just one part of this is a sense that where there is a complaint, it will be dealt with seriously. And I, I thought, great, let's mm. let's make sure as far as possible that this report has some action. Page 40 talks about the high costs of misconduct, Chris. And if anyone's wondering, and I don't know why you would, um, why apart from just being a decent human being and doing the right thing, why this is important, page 40 talks to the high cost of misconduct. Um, the enormous cost to individuals that are affected, um, the opportunity costs for organisations because as we sort of touched on in another context, you don't recruit as well as you might, you miss opportunities, you don't have good conversations, uh, the damage to productivity and reputation. So, you know, the report goes into a great de deal of detail why not only from an ethical point of view, but but in terms of a value proposition, this stuff is important. So does it say any anywhere in there that the use of alcohol is an acceptable excuse for these types of misconduct? Um, the report talks to the use of alcohol, and I think that's been widely uh, reported in the media, Chris. I've, I've got to say I'm in two minds about this because um, it's a workplace and workplaces really need to... Um, you know, consider use of alcohol sparingly, if at all. But there is a danger also that if we just head down the use of alcohol path, um, we miss some other recurring themes in the report. And one of the glaringly recurring themes is about power imbalances. Mm -hmm. And um, this is not the first report. This is not, you know, the Royal Commission into Family Violence, a range of other reports, the Vago report. Um, talks to the fact that power imbalances are, you know, at the root cause of all of this. So, yes, certainly alcohol is a topic, but can we not just sort of deal with that and think that we've actually solved the issue? Absolutely. Power imbalances and gender inequality, which is going to lead me to something else in a moment. Yeah, and, and, and look, and, and that's true, that gender inequality topic, but again, it's not binary. And I know in the work that Deborah Wu's been doing um, in particular with VLGA, part of the issue of dealing with gender inequality is also about dealing with intersectionalities that, in fact, um, diversity and inclusion generally, um, you know, the disabled, multicultural, LGBTIQ+, um, all of those elements of diversity, if you deal with those, then you also deal with gender inequality along the way, Chris. Yeah, so um, let me run this one by you. This has come to light uh, in the last 24 hours and it's getting quite a bit of attention uh, online, at least, certainly through my Twitter um, network, and that is the new Board of Regional Capitals Australia, Steve. So Regional Capitals Australia has 51, I did a little bit of uh, research on this, 51 members, regional capitals around Australia. Um, somehow they've ended up with their new board being all male. Deliberate pause, Chris. Yeah. Um, I don't know what... Congratulations to those board members, but um, maybe someone could have looked ahead. Yeah, so I wonder how... Honestly, I wonder how this happens in, in this day and age is it um is it a systemic thing where the the and by that i mean the system that brings forward the nominations whether they're one from each state i'm assuming um is blind to what's happening in the other states and they 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 don't have this gender lens factored in could it be as simple as that 
I I can only imagine that so, Chris, but you and I have both been attending essential director, the annual essential director workshops that the OECD run every sort of October um, annually. And the topic of board diversity has been around for several years. It's like there is no reason for it not to be on anyone's radar. And I, it's I, about I, going further than just, you know, putting some token females on the board. It is around taking the topic seriously. Yeah. When, when you look through those 51 cities, regional capitals, many of them have very, very high profile, very capable female mayors. There's at least three in Victoria alone, in La Trobe, Greater mm. Geelong, Greater Shepparton, just from my, my quick look. And that's to say, to take nothing away from Councillor Daniel Maloney, the Mayor of Ballarat, who's oh. a very effective mayor and will be a very effective chair of this group, I'm absolutely certain. But I think it just begs the question, how does, how does it get to the point where there's an all-male board? Um, and I'll also make the point that the two outgoing uh, members of the board were male as well, the mayors of Tamworth and Wagga Wagga. So uh, I'm assuming that means last year it was an all-male board. And I don't remember there being this level of discussion about it last year. Yeah. Which tells you something about where the, the discourse has gone in that time. Yeah, and I think in that sense, that's, um, you know, there's elements of the Jenkins report in that, that where where issues of power and gender inequality aren't addressed, it damages reputation. You know, there's sort of another exhibit um, that, you know, many councils um, have signed pledges around ensuring that they only attend events where panels are um, exhibiting gender balance. This is a live topic for all of those councils who are um, participating in the 16 days of activism, Chris. So again, I don't want to be critical of the individuals who have been elected, but collectively, it appears that there was um, there was a blind spot. All right, uh, we might come back to that. Um, I will perhaps reach out to someone to try and find out a bit more about the process to at least, you know, um, shed some light on, on, on how it ended up where it ended up. Steve, uh, we're moving into summer series next week. Any thoughts on uh, what we'll be doing for the governance update? I assume we're going to have to, have to do some of it uh, live from um, suburban cricket or something, are we? Are we oh, to look, I'll just have, cricket to, uh, just have to wait and see. We won't be uh, we won't be having the corporate background, and there might be a different um, code of dress, Chris. <laughs> yes, well, you're allowed you're allowed to go into summer mode. Oh, woohoo! <laughs> <laughs> and. Um, uh, I, I have got a little story to finish on, but uh, I just want to um, make the point that we've been having a bit of a chat about, perhaps this is a, a plug for something we will spend some more time on, um, trees and the issues of trees that councils deal with. And I think summer's a good time to explore some of that. Uh, look, I think so, Chris. I was, it's funny, actually, I was in a conversation this week with someone who said they were a bit sort of intimidated because governance sounds so serious. But um, if we can get any contributions during the week about the governance implications for council tree policies, um, we'd welcome them. That'll give us some um, from grist, some grist for our tree mill. Uh, yeah. So, yeah, let's talk about that next week. Now, did we hear any more about, I think you were following up with someone on the, uh, the related to the Moreland matter and the potential name change, about the process that needs to be followed to, to change the name of the council. Did you do some homework? Uh, no, the only homework, I did have a brief conversation with our good friend Tony Rowney at um, Hunt and Hunt Lawyers, and Tony reminded me that Place Names Victoria um, do have a rather excellent process available in terms of naming protocols generally, but I don't, and we didn't get into that level of detail about what the sort of legal machinations would be um, if the council, having gone through a consultation process, decides to proceed down that path. Right, so that's another one in the let's keep a watching brief. Uh, it is. Okay. I want to tell you a story, Steve, and get your reaction. This has happened in the UK this week, where um, drivers have been hit with fines of £70 for parking their cars over yellow lines. Well, of course they should, Chris. You don't park your car over a yellow line. Double yellow lines? Do you think that's pretty universal, that people would know that? If they saw those double yellow lines, they park on them, they should be fined? I think, and unless the yellow line was faded, of course, or something like that, or there was some other extenuating circumstance, Chris, that might warrant the withdrawal of the fine. What then... if the double yellow lines weren't there when you parked, but they were when you came back? 
Well, that would be impossible, Chris, because how would you? Ah. <laughs> well, you know what? What did Sherlock Holmes used to say? Um, you know, remove the impossible, and you're left with perhaps the improbable. Um, and this is this is definitely one of those cases. So, what's happened in uh, Ely or Early, which is part of Wokingham Borough Council? People have parked their vehicles as they normally do along this stretch of road and gone off about their business. Um, council contractors have come along with a crane, okay, with a crane and a truck, and they've lifted each car, this is what's been found to have happened, uh, very carefully, and painted the double lines and put the cars back. And they've been, um, I don't know whether this is coordinated, I suspect it wasn't. Uh, I think it's just, you know, what, what's our saying? Um, it, you might suspect a conspiracy, but it's probably a stuff up. Mm. Um, the parking enforcement officers have followed along and put uh, infringement notices on them for parking on double yellow lines. Can you imagine people are a little bit upset about this? I normally try to think that there's a logical explanation to these sort of things, Chris, but I think people would be a bit upset. But it has achieved one objective. Yes. It certainly got the message out about the no standing area in that particular street. And um, the community is very clear about that point. Uh, perhaps we might have applied a few different communication strategies. Well, the council's been accused of acting like the mafia. Um, they, have, uh, they have accepted that they've acted in error and that it was a gaffe and they've uh, said they will cancel those fines. So all's well that ends well. But just when you think uh, it's not possible to stuff up even worse as a local authority. There's a good example that we should take heed of. Uh, yeah, I should just say though, Chris, I've you know watched the odd um, Godfather movie, and um, uh, I've never seen the mafia actually lift cars with cranes. Yeah. That's a bit harsh. <laughs> <laughs> maybe maybe a tad overweight. But anyway, um, um, I'm sure JLF has managed to show you some of the pictures uh, as we've been talking for the edited version of this. And I think that's where we might leave it for this week. Uh, lots to talk about as always, Steve. Thank you. Have a good week. Thanks, Chris. You too. Steve Cooper, Chief of Staff of the VLGA. That's the Governance Update brought to you by Hunt and Hunt Lawyers. Thank you for your company. We'll see you again soon. Bye for now.